Hello and welcome back to Crash Course. So today we're going to be looking at part three of the gastrointestinal system. So in part one and two we looked at the anatomy and physiology and embryology and then we also looked at the innovation and vasculature of the GI system. So in this video we're going to be looking at the pathway of the GI system from the entrance to the exit and also having a look at the histology. We're then going to have finished with some MCQs which we started with and also some harder MCQs which hopefully you'll have learnt the answers to as you've been going through these videos. So, let's have a think about the overall GI pathway. It starts when we eat. So we eat the food, and then as it moves through, it mixes and moves throughout the body and comes in contact with secretions and fluid uh, and enzymes as it goes. It then becomes digested into smaller pieces and absorbed into the bloodstream. Finally, it's then excreted of the waste products. So the GI pathway starts in the mouth. And there are several accessory glands or organs in the mouth that aid the digestive process. So you have the teeth, the tongue and the salivary glands. So we have 32 teeth which are on the anterior and lateral edges of the mouth and they're designed to cut and grind our food into smaller pieces. The mastication is the mechanical breakdown of food by the chewing and the chopping of teeth. The tongue so the outer layer contains those rough papillae that we talked about in video one for gripping the food as it's moved by the tongue muscles. It also has taste buds to allow us de to detect the taste molecules in food. And it also helps push the food posteriorly for swallowing. And lastly, absorption in the mouth. So absorption of small molecules such as glucose and water can occur just simply across the mucosa. So salivary glands in a little bit more detail. They're very complex and they have numerous acini lined by secretory epithelium. So we have three paired salivary glands. These are the parotid, the submandibular and the sublingual. And they all produce saliva. So the parotid gland is the largest and it's in an irregular shape and it's outside of your cavity. And it secretes 25% of our saliva. It produces a watery secretion which is rich in protein. And immunoglobulins are secreted to fight microorganisms and A amylase is also secreted to start the carbohydrate breakdown in the mouth. So already digestion begins in the mouth, particularly of carbohydrates, by the release of the amylase enzyme. The submandibular gland secretes 70% of our saliva, so it secretes the most saliva, and the duct opens near the frenulum of the tongue. It produces a thick secretion which is rich in mucin, which is lubricant, but less protein than the parotid gland. The sublingual is the final paired hook. Um, salivary gland and it only secretes around 5% of our saliva. It secretes very sticky secretions due to a large amount of mucin which is present and the mucin acts as a buffer and again lubrication as it did from the submandibular gland. Next from the mouth we move into the esophagus so imagine we've been to the back of the mouth into the pharynx so the oropharynx down to the laryngopharynx and now we're in the esophagus which is a muscular tube connecting the pharynx to the stomach. It carries the swallowed masses of chewed food along its length, and the food is moved by peristalsis, so muscular contractions by the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscles of the esophagus. There's a lower esophageal sphincter as well, at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach, which can close to trap the food in the stomach and prevent the backflow into the esophagus. So then, after the esophagus, we move into the stomach. And the stomach is a muscular sac on the left side of the abdominal cavity, which is just inferior to the diaphragm. So approximately the size of two fists placed next to each other and it acts as a storage tank for our food so the body's got time to di digest large meals properly before releasing chyme into the duodenum. The release of hydrochloric acid in the stomach keeps the pH low at approximately 2 and digestion also continues in the stomach um, by the release of digestive enzymes. And it can be anatomically divided as we looked at in the anatomy in video 1 into a fundus, cardia, body and pylorus. And remember, it's got those rugae in its surface to allow it to expand when the food enters. It's also got gastric pits, which contain the cells that secrete digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid. So this is an example of a, digestive, of a gastric pit. And you can see that it contains goblet cells, which produce mucus. So this protects the stomach lining. Remember that the stomach is a low pH, it's secreting acid. So the lining of the stomach needs to be protected. And the mucus secreted by the goblet cells does that. So parietal cells secretes that um, hydrochloric acid, but it also secretes intrinsic factor. Chief cells secrete pepsinogen, which is a protease precursor. D cells are also present, which secrete somatostatin, which inhibits the acid secretion. And G cells, 
uh, which secrete gastrin, which stimulate acid secretion. So there's a balance between somatostatin and gastrin because obviously one inhibits and one stimulates acid secretion. After you've been for the stomach, you go to the duodenum. But don't forget about the accessory organs, the liver, gallbladder and the pancreas, which occur in this pathway. So the liver is a triangular accessory organ of the digestive system, located on the right-hand side in the right hypochondrium, mainly just inferior to the diaphragm. It produces bile and metabolizes nutrients. It also detoxifies several metabolites, so for example, um, alcohol, but also it increases the breakdown of bilirubin and estrogen. The gallbladder is a small pear-shaped organ just inferior to the liver and it stores and concentrates the bile that the liver has created and the gallbladder then releases the bile during digestion through the cystic duct combined with the common hepatic duct and go into the common bile duct which goes down towards the duodenum. The gallbladder also recycles excess bile from the small intestine so that it can be reused in subsequent meal digestion. And remember that bile is a thick fluid it emulsifies lipids in the intestines. So bile is released from the gallbladder when it receives the signal that the duodenum has food present. So when chyme has come from the stomach, through the pylorus, into the duodenum. Next we have the pancreas, which is a large gland located just inferior posterior to the stomach. And it's made of a head, neck, tail and unsonate process. The tail of the uh, pancreas tickles the spleen. And the pancreas is both exocrine and endocrine function. So the endocrine function of the pancreas is a is of course hormones. So hormones that are released from the islets of Langerhans, alpha, beta and delta cells. The exocrine function, however, is 80% of the pancreas and it's released from these acini cells which secrete into the ducts. So the acini cells secrete digestive enzymes, proenzymes into the small intestine to aid with chemical digestion of the food. And it secretes inactive enzymes for one very important reason. Because if it secreted active enzymes, it would self-digest. It would digest the pancreas. And therefore, it secretes inactive enzymes in order to prevent the digestion of the pancreas itself. So these are the uh, proenzymes that the pancreas releases. So trypsinogen, um, chymotrypsinogen, carboxypeptidase. And then there's, don't forget, like we've said, that they're released as proenzymes. And then they become activated once they mix with the chyme. Uh, and the acidic aspect of the uh, food in the duodenum. So next we have the small intestine as a as a whole. So remember the small intestine is composed of the duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum. The duodenum allows that mixing function of the digestive secretions from the pancreas and liver with the contents that's expelled from the stomach. Then you have your jejunum, which is responsible for the majority of the digestion and absorption that occurs in the digestive system. And then you have the ileum which is the longest segment and empties into the cecum at the ileocecal junction. So the enzymes and bile salts from the pancreas and gallbladder enter at the ampulla of varta and they act on the chyme that's been released from the stomach and allow further digestion. Now the food constituents, so the fats, the carbs and the proteins, are broken down and absorbed into the blood, so via the villi, particularly present in the jejunum. Remember, the jejunum is responsible for the majority of the digestion and absorption. Next we have the large intestine. So this is a long, thick tube located just inferior to the stomach and there's no villi in the large intestine. So one key difference uh, between the small and large intestine is the presence of villi in the small intestine. So anatomically, the large intestine flows from the appendix to the cecum, to the ascending colon, to the transverse, and then to the descending colon. And lastly, you have the sigmoid colon and the rectum. The walls of the colon are made up of haustra, so these are the pouches that are held under high tension by the thick bands of muscle, so the muscle is called the tenai coli. And it, the large intestine allows absorption of water, sugar, salts and vitamins into the body. It contains many symbiotic bacteria that aid in the breakdown um, of waste to extract some small amounts of nutrients. And the rectum expands to hold the feces, so remember they are thick mus muscular bands, so the sphincters, control the passage of the faeces. And the faeces in the large intestine exit the body then through the anal canal and the rectum. Just a little bit more on the hormone CCK, so cholecystokinin. It's a regulator of small intestine digestion and an integrator of brain and gut function. So this possibly should have come after the small intestine um, slide, but essentially CCK stimulates pancreatic enzyme secretion. So how does the pancreas know when to release those proenzymes? Well, it's when CCK is present. Um, when it's released from the eye cells um, in the small intestine. 
So it stimulates pancreatic enzyme secretion, it stimulates gallbladder contraction, so therefore the release of bile, and thereby promoting small intestine digestion. But what does it inhibit? Well, it inhibits food intake. It says, why, right, we're full, and therefore we're going to digest what we've got, so stop eating. And it inhibits gastric emptying via the vagal afferent neurons, thereby delaying nutrient delivery to the small intestine. Uh, and this is a little summary of some of the hormones that are released. So peptide YY, uh, glucagon-like peptide, ghrelin, amylin, and cholecystokinin are some of the most important ones where they're released and what causes their increase or decrease. Next, look at histology. So a brief guide to histology. Um, take a look at some of the images. Make sure you can identify what it is without being told um, and the aspects of it. So this is the upper esophagus. Um, and you may be able to see the layers, so you can see the stratified squamous epithelium here, uh, which is non keratinized And then you've got this muscularis extensor. So remember that the esophagus is very muscular to allow the peristalsis for movement of food into the stomach. Then you've got a stomach, which you should be able to see the characteristic layers, so there's a mucosa, the submucosa, uh, the muscularis mucosa as well, etc. The duodenum as well, so you, here importantly here you can see the mucosa, the submucosa, you can see the villi of uh, the duodenum. And then finally with the liver, make sure you can identify the important structures, so the central vein, the bile duct, hepatic arteries, and the portal vein, particularly, and remember this is the portal system made up of the hepatic artery, the portal vein, and the bile duct, to be able to identify that on a histological slide. So just to summarise, we have three questions which we looked at at the beginning, and then we have two questions which we've not yet seen, so harder MCQs. So if you don't want to do the ones that we did at the beginning, if you got them right, for example, at the start of part one, then by all means skip past this bit and go to the harder questions. Um, but if not, it might be useful to review what you might have learned in these videos. So question one, um, what GI layer is characterised by having a tough fibrous connective tissue? So hopefully by now you know that the serosa um, is on the outside of those GI layers, and therefore it needs to be tough and fibrous, uh, made up of connective tissue. Question two, what part of the nervous system division uh, normally stimulates and promotes digestion? So again, hopefully by now you know that the answer to this is parasympathetic. And that the reason for this is all to do with the fact that the parasympathetic nervous system is all about resting and digesting, um, and the sympathetic nervous system is all about fight and flight response. Question three, so this asks what type of cell secretes hydrochloric acid and hopefully by now you do know that it's the parietal cell that secretes hydrochloric acid uh, and hopefully you're aware of what some of these other cells now secrete, so delta cells particularly be aware of somatostatin. This also came up in the endocrine block, so being aware that delta cells are somatostatin and somatostatin puts a stop to everything. Mucus to from the goblet cells to protect the lining of the stomach and also pepsinogen from the chief cells. So harder MCQs then, so question one, bile facilitates digestion by causing what of fats? Is it hydrolysis of fats, digestion of fats, catalysis of fats, or emulsification? So think about where bile is produced and how it acts on the fats and where it acts on them um, and how it allows digestion of them. So correctly fats are being essentially in the long run digested however bile allows emulsification of fats okay so if this did actually come up earlier on and quote from an earlier side is that bile is a thick fluid that emulsifies lipids in the intestines question two where does the majority of nutrient absorption occur is it the jejunum the ileum the duodenum and the large intestine so this is tricky because all aspects here do actually take part in nutrient absorption. However, it is the jejunum which does the majority uh, of the nutrient absorption. The ileum, duodenum, and large intestine all do absorb nutrients at some point. Um, however, um, it's the jejunum which does the majority of the absorption. So that's everything for the GI revision series. I hope you found it useful. Um, as always, the slides are available under the Documents tab. Um, on the website and if you do have any questions please feel free to either email me or message me personally uh, and again as always any feedback is greatly appreciated thank you very much for listening